We are now moving to our first panel discussion uh, that will be moderated by Lady Bianco, um, former judge of the European Court, uh, professor at University of Strasbourg, but more importantly, our partner in crime, one of the founders um, of this forum. So a real delight um, to have Lady here co-moderate. And at our panel, uh, we will have Judge Ksenia Turkovic, Vice President of the Court, Judge Timaike, Vice President of the Section, and Judge Ivana Jelic, who will join us online. We will then move to the questions and answers session, um, but we will first have an address from Judge Faris Rehabovic. I will just make a few um, technical notes, um, sort of explaining how will this differ from how we worked um, back in October last year, um, simply, to, simply for those um, who have been with us and for those who haven't been with us last October to explain how we've structured the session of the next hour and a half. As I say, for the first uh, 45 minutes, we will, um, we will hear the presentations from our panelists. Then we will invite each hub um, to address us with one or two questions. The questions may come from moderators or they may come from participants. Feel free to speak uh, in any language you're most comfortable in. We have simultaneous interpretation and we will be all able to follow your questions. What we will probably do is sort of go to three hubs initially, take questions, then put them back to the panel and then take the second set of the hubs. Um, we will then also um, look at the questions we will be getting online uh, because like last year, this year we have a facility for those who are following us online uh, to pose questions and then of course um, to the judges in this room if you would like to address panel or, or sort of comment on anything, uh, you would be most welcome. I will now hand over um, to Lady who will make a short introduction and we'll hear from the panelists. Thank you, Biliana. Good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to come back to the, the forum uh, in presence, uh, at least for some of us uh, here in Dubrovnik. Uh, as it was already said, this year's forum deals with the uh, independence and impartiality of the, of the judiciary, a topic which is extremely delicate and highly debated uh, in the region, and there have been several specific studies prepared on this issue, uh, also by political scientists, but also judges, and etc. Uh, referring mostly, I refer to my, my friend over here, Ksenia Turkovic, Croatia as a good example of judicial reforms in the, in the region. Uh, this panel will discuss uh, a specific and extremely delicate issue uh, of this broad topic, independence and impartiality of the uh, of the judiciary, which is a tribunal established by law. And it is uh, extremely important and uh, timely because in the last, I can say, 12 months in Strasbourg, there have been major, major developments specifically on uh, this issue. And we have today uh, uh, four judges together with Ivana and Faris that will be joining uh, online. Uh, discussing this issue. I know there have been debates within the court, uh, especially the, the, the leading, there's so much discussed uh, judgment in uh, Astri, Astrat, sometimes speak. I'm pronouncing under the control of, of the president the name in Icelandic, uh, where you can see also the d different opinions of the, of the judges in the grand cha chamber about this issue, which is not an easy one. So I will give the floor uh, one by one, starting with Ksenia Turkovic, uh, Vice President of the Court, to uh, start and analyze this issue, which we agree is a tricky one. Ksenia, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I suppose we can uh, stay here, we don't have to go to... No, we stay here. We, we stay here, that, that's how it works. Uh, I will use the privilege to speak in my uh, mother tongue, uh, so I will switch to Croatia now because I think it's more beneficial for the judges in the hubs if they can listen and most of them uh, uh, can understand uh, Croatian. I will be speaking in, in Croatian. Uh, as I said, 
It's truly a privilege to be with you again at this forum. Every year it uh, brings us very interesting topics for discussion. It is the forum is also uh, important for another reason, which unfortunately we will not manage to provide this year, uh, and that is uh, the opportunity to spend some time together with other judges and other legal professionals. This time that we spent together, uh, we from the region together uh, with the, the judges of the European Court of Human Rights, is something I hope we will come back to once uh, this all is over. I believe that kind of uh, time spent together is extremely useful for all of us. According to the agenda, according to the, our, uh, our internal agreement, um, I am supposed to say something about the right to uh, a tribunal established by law. I will focus on this uh, segment and on relevant case, case law that Lady mentioned. A lot has been said already about the importance of institutional requirements uh, provided for by uh, Article 6 and the requirement to uh, ensure uh, a tribunal established by law, which is uh, independent and uh, impartial. And uh, actually, its relevance and its link to the separation of powers and rule of law uh, and uh, this link, uh, this relevance to the rule of law, uh, I will underline because it requires protection, safeguard of independence of judiciary, where independence of judiciary contributes and results in uh, rule of law, ensuring rule of law by applying law in an impartial, independent, fair and efficient manner. So there's this relationship also with the concept of separation of powers because it's a fundamental guarantee of uh, the independence of the judiciary as a whole, especially with respect to executive and parliament, uh, legis legislative power. And at the same time, independence of the judiciary ensures adequate implementation of checks and balances. The importance of these institutional requirements uh, f in order to uh, and is uh, that the judiciary can uh, perform their fundamental uh, role. What, when I say this, I'm merely repeating the findings of the court in uh, Retskovic versus Poland from 2021. Uh, which was handed, handed down only a, a month ago. And uh, the court quoted uh, a, a whole set of different uh, international and European documents. If you look at the judgment, somewhere between uh, paragraphs 130 and 160, you will see all these uh, references there. I will try. Yes, thank you. I will try to speak uh, more slowly. Important and um, relevant uh, judgments, relevant to our topic, is Gudmundur Astradson, uh, that lady mentioned already, versus uh, Iceland. Astradson, I hope I pronounced it uh, well. Uh, uh, and this judgment is actually um, a, well, some sort of an inception or uh, um, of a, I, I will not say a new approach, but an expanded approach uh, to this um, uh, concept of uh, uh, tribunal established by law. Then we also have two extremely important judgments delivered by the first section. These are at the level of the seven member chamber, Xerofopov versus Poland and Retskovic versus Poland. Retskovic versus Poland was just recently published. And it is actually the most recent judgment. So each of these judgments addresses um, specific issues related to um, court established by law issue, especially these two Polish judgments which have been um, handled by the court for a while 
and the Icelandic case was actually what was waiting uh, what was uh, waited for uh, in order for these two judgments to be uh, formulated. This segment, as pointed out by Robert, when we speak about institutional requirements of Article 6, is extremely important when we look at the context in which all these developments are taking place and the context in which we have been living uh, and that uh, Robert so nicely elaborated. So we're talking about the expanding of uh, the scope of this, right, uh, which contributes to um, reinforcing rule of law in this segment. Question number one that one can raise, which is very well elaborated in this guide that you have all received, is actually the question of uh, that we dealt with in the case Xerofor, where the government uh, actually found, uh, um, said that the Polish Constitutional Court did not have the character of a court, of a tribunal. So uh, we first needed to determine whether the Constitutional Court of Poland is actually a court. And, well, ultimately that wasn't so hard to determine because there were already uh, previous judgments uh, in the same uh, area and our court said yes and the uh, truth be told the Polish court actually and um, its uh, scope of authority uh, is such that it does not deal with individual cases uh, it merely uh, handles uh, uh, general issues related to constitutionality of specific pieces of legislation but given that the decisions of the constitutional court in such cases make possible for parties to uh, require request reopening of their cases in line with the decision of the constitutional court our court decided or found actually that the constitutional court of poland does have the character of a court and therefore uh, um, we were able to move on uh, to uh, discussing the merits of the case uh, etc for case the aim of this requirement, of this established by law requirement, is to ensure that the organization of uh, the court system in a de democratic society does not depend on discretionary powers of the executive branch of power. Instead, it is regulated by the legislation adopted by the parliament, and that is extremely important. This requirement does have three dimensions. One of them relates to the fact that the court uh, must uh, have a legal basis for its own um, existence. Secondly, the um, uh, scope of authority and competence and the composition of a court must be defined by the law. And the third segment, uh, a novel one brought by the Icelandic uh, judgment, is that the requirement also relates to the necessity of uh, uh, implementation of provisions regarding appointment of judges. The Iceland uh, judgment actually makes the procedure of appointing uh, uh, judges uh, has become an uh, inherent um, part of the concept of established by law. Uh, appointment of judges judges must be in line with the constitutional law which was in force at the point uh, at the moment of appointment and the mere fact that this was not done so uh, can by itself lead to uh, a violation of uh, article 6 of the convention so once uh, such conclusion has been made once the court has made actually such a conclusion uh, there must be a, uh, a link must be found uh, uh, with the uh, irremovability of judges and uh, these things must be brought into some kind of balance and this is actually what the court um, takes into consideration when uh, handling these cases. And in order for the court to be able to respond to some questions, in order for the court to strike such balance, the court has developed a special uh, test uh, 
which comprises uh, three questions uh, that uh, the court tries to respond to. The que question number one is, has there been a uh, clear violation of um, national uh, uh, legislation? In other words, uh, those that are in charge of appointment, have they been acting uh, in line with the uh, procedures and uh, obligations uh, provided for by the national law. So we are practically uh, looking into whether a decision has been properly explained if that is required by the national law. Uh, have all the qualifications of all candidates have been um, properly analyzed? If there are any uh, judgments or decisions of the constitutional court, have uh, these been um, um, adhered to uh, and uh, implemented in practice. So, and if the national court already found violation of the national legislation, then our court will not um, consider that issue at all unless the decision of the national uh, body has been arbitrary or obviously or clearly unreasonable. Existence of clear or manifest uh, violation must be clearly identified and effectively identified. If we look at these three cases um, uh, dealt uh, with by the court, Astridson, in the case Astridson, in the case of Iceland, the national courts had already been uh, determined that the national uh, had already found violation of the national uh, uh, legislation in Serofor case. In that case, the situation was somewhat different and the court did deal with this. We did con analyze uh, the situation in this respect. So what was, uh, well, the question raised here was uh, whether the five uh, judges of the Constitutional Court have been uh, uh, appointed in uh, accordance with the law and the Constitution. More precisely, these five judges had their term of office expired at approximately the same time. The three three of them had their term of office expired at the, uh, when the old same was uh, in sitting uh, uh, in uh, and according to the national law, same which is in term of office. Uh, at a specific time is the one that appoints and selects uh, uh, the judge of the Constitutional Court. And when the eighth same uh, term of office began, it did not want to recognize this previous decision, so it uh, selected all five judges and the president. They uh, took their oath uh, with the president, uh, um, and the president accepted such uh, oath uh, of all these three, uh, these five uh, judges instead of the three, uh, and did not uh, take uh, into consideration or disregarded the oath of the previous three uh, judges. Also, in the case of Retskievich, the judge was in a situation that he or she had to take a position on that issue because at the national level, the case law uh, was um, not uh, uniformed. And uh, when the uh, issue of whether appointment of judges in the disciplinary uh, council, uh, it was concerned whether it was uh, implemented in accordance with the law. Uh, the court found that the uh, position taken by the Supreme Court was the uh, position that was in line with the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and that is in uh, line with uh, a whole set of European and other international documents relevant to this area. The second issue that the court is trying to respond to is whether the breach of uh, domestic law had to do with any of the fundamental provisions because and also because of course uh, any breach of law 
does every breach of the law in terms of uh, appointment leads to the breach of Article 6? And here the court was uh, restrictive in its standpoint they, uh, by saying that this needs to be a fundamental provision. And the court always uh, looks to see whether it is those actual provisions that are being breached. And in these cases, the court did find that these were, in fact, uh, fundamental provisions that were being breached, like in Icelandic case, um, the minister does have the right to appoint persons who have not been uh, nominated by the latest evaluation commission, uh, but uh, by the uh, evaluation commission, but they need to, of course, re-examine the qualifications of these candidates. And this was something that was not, in fact, done. And also, the parliament did not uh, vote in a professional manner. They actually uh, took a vote uh, uh, as a uh, took a collective vote instead of uh, as voting as per each candidate individually. Also, uh, looking at the Xela 4 case, this was also a fundamental breach because uh, there was um, a deviation from the uh, Constitution and also in the Retskovic case, uh, the court also found that this was a fundamental breach because there was a, a change in the way judges were appointed judges that took part in the uh, State Judicial Council because after then they were to be appointed by judges and then the law was actually amended and with this uh, law amendment uh, A mo uh, appointment of judges was to be done by this by exclusively by the legislative authority and the court found that this was basically uh, a possibility for excessive um, influence of the um, uh, executive and legislative branch onto the uh, selection of judges uh, by means of this uh, state uh, judicial council also, the third issue that needs to be reflected is whether domestic courts considered this subject matter and whether they try to solve it. If they did try and managed to solve it, then it's all fine and well. But if this was not the case, like for example, in the Icelandic case, they, uh, the the court uh, national court did consider but did not resolve this subject matter. Then this uh, requirement was not met. And also in the Poland cases, uh, national courts uh, do not even have the possibility to to review uh, this particular subject matter. So there's no. In fact, uh, there has been uh, this thir third criterion has not in fact been met. Um, I would recommend everyone to read these particular three judgments because they uh, largely rely on different documents at the uh, level of uh, Council of Europe, European Union, international community, and they actually incorporate the, the uh, spirit of these documents into the um, judge, judgments rendered by the court. Um, also, what's very, what's very important is that when it comes to appointment of judges, it's not all about professional qualifications such as uh, knowledge, um, uh, the uh, knack for uh, analysis, but also what's important is integrity of judges and also the possibility to render just and fair uh, judgments. In court decisions, uh, communication, being open for communication, and a whole series of qualities which are actually of uh, um, great importance for a judiciary to be able to act uh, the way we want it to act in a democratic society so that, of course, uh, judicial authorities would be independent and impartial. And I will wrap up by saying what Robert uh, touched upon, which is the diversity of the judicial bench. And why I'm saying this, we mostly talk about domestic judges, but I don't think we should, uh, you know, uh, uh, reflect from mentioning international courts. It's been nine years that I've been judging this court, and uh, I'm so saddened by the fact that uh, there is this uh, backsliding, uh, even in the European Court of Human Rights. 
So there has been a significant decrease in the number of uh, women in a judicial bench. And uh, I believe that uh, the countries itself need to be uh, aware of this. And the Council of Europe also needs to pay a bit more attention to that as well. Uh, Uh, normally in grand chamber it's up to three women so it's it's a uh, it's too few in my opinion so if, uh, it's a diversity that we're uh, in the D uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, um, then in some other segments of the European Court of Human Rights then it's even fewer so this is something that we should uh, pay, uh, diversity is something we should be paying attention to not just in domestic courts but also at the, the uh, Court of Human Rights European Court of Human Rights and by saying this I will wrap up thank you Thank you very much, Xenia. Uh, we know that you would talk for hours on this topic, especially because you have uh, you've been involved in all the three uh, judgments that you mentioned. I would just underline that Astrat, Astrat Sun and Zero, Zero Floor are included in the guide. And actually, the Astrat, Astrat Sun three criteria have been pointed out. Zero floor was added really at the last moment when the guide was going for print and for trans translation, but it was managed mostly by Hannah to to uh, to include, to summarize, and to include these important judgments of the for, of the first section. Now I move to Tim Aike. Uh, on the topic of the key criteria to determine uh, if a tribunal is independent and Tim uh, or impartial. Impartial. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, you uh, will deal with that and see whether there are links with the tribunal established by law and the other criteria. I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it to you, please, Tim. Thank you very much, lady. Thank you very much, Lydia, and thank you very much indeed to the organizers for inviting me back to contribute to this essential forum um, in the region. It is a real pleasure and a privilege to be with you again, and this time at least slightly less distant than last year when we all came together uh, and met with you remotely from Baden-Baden. My topic today, as Lady said, for the next eight to ten minutes or so, is to outline the key criteria relevant to assessing and ensuring the impartiality of a court or tribunal, and I'll leave the cross-links, I think, to the discussions um, after. A fuller exposition of this topic, as with all the topics, with reference to and including the summaries of many of the court's key cases, can, of course, be found in um, this impressive and extremely useful publication um, produced by the organizers, which I understand has been made available to you today, um, both in English and in your own languages. Like the two um, other issues uh, you were hearing about this morning, um, impartiality and the safeguards to guarantee such impartiality are key requirements expressly required by Article 6 of the Convention, as well as reflected in our own, that's my court's rule of, look, rule of the court, and our new resolution on judicial ethics, which the President mentioned earlier this morning, for courts and tribunals to fulfill their essential role in any democracy governed by the rule of law. Before identifying the key criteria for, of impartiality, it is perhaps worth stressing two things. The, the first is that it is the responsibility of each of us, each individual judge, to identify any impediment to hearing a matter and either to withdraw or when faced with a situation in which it is arguable that a judge should be disqualified although not unequivocally excluded by law, to bring the matter to the attention of either the president of the composition, the president of the court, or to the attention of the parties in order to enable them to challenge the participation of the judge. And secondly, that there must also be systemic sufficient guarantees and safeguards in the form of national procedures and regulations in place to exclude any legitimate doubts in relation to a judge's impartiality such as rules regulating the withdrawal of a judge, which in our court can be found in regulation in Rule 28 of our Rules of Court. The first important aspect to note uh, in relation to the key criteria is that impartiality is assessed both by reference to a subjective test 
um, that is whether a judge holds any personal prejudice or bias in a given case, and by reference to an objective test, that is whether there are ascertainable facts which give rise to a legitimate doubt or fear that a particular judge or tribunal lacks the necessary impartiality. That said, there is no strict watertight separation between the two, and they may, may well overlap, which is why frequently you will find that the analysis is in fact a holistic analysis looking at both um, criteria. In our own case law, you will see that when um, we consider the impartiality of a judge, however, it, it will frequently be the objective test that is determinative. And the reason for this is, is one of practicalities. Uh, the court in Strasbourg has made clear that under the subjective test, the personal impartiality of a judge must be presumed until there is proof to the contrary. As our case law demonstrates, such proof is difficult, but not impossible to adduce. Um, most frequently, it will be evidence of personal convictions, interests or behavior of a judge, such as displays of personal hostilities to a party, which may establish subjective um, a lack of subjective impartiality. But by contrast, when applying the objective test, both the judge, him or herself, as well as any tribunal required to consider his or her impartiality, will have to consider whether there are objectively justified doubts as to that judge's impartiality. In this assessment, the views of those challenging the impartiality is irrelevant and even, is relevant, sorry, and even important, but it cannot be um, and is not decisive. Once this test is satisfied, the judge in question should not hear or on a challenge have heard the matter, even if there is no evidence of subjective bias. After all, what is at stake is the confidence which the president spoke about this morning, which the courts in a democratic society must inspire in the public. In that context, even appearances are of importance a principle that is reflected in the much repeated adage, justice must not only be done, but it must also be seen to be done. The objective test itself is largely functional in nature. Um, so you look at um, the question whether there are personal or hierarchical links between the judge and the parties to the proceeding, or whether the judge plays or has played multiple roles in the same proceedings or involving proceedings, uh, in proceedings involving some or both of the parties. Um, and when I say um, played a role, that may mean a, a direct role, an active role, and a formal role, um, whether in, the, in, the, um, in exercising judicial functions, a previous advisory function, or as counsel to one of the parties in the previous um, life before becoming a judge, or as a member of the executive or the legislative. The same test of um, functional nature would also be triggered where a judge acts as a complainant, witness, or prosecutor in the same case um, in which he sits as a, a judge. And that most frequently occurs in cases where there are either, um, in certain jurisdictions, contempt of court proceedings which are dealt with by the court who feels uh, itself to have been the subject of that contempt or in um, various judicial disciplinary proceedings. Now, one of the areas of particular difficulty in this context, which I think is important to highlight, arises in proceedings where, for example, there is no prosecutor present at a criminal hearing or where one of the parties in civil proceedings is unrepresented and the judge therefore is required uh, or feels required to call and examine or cross-examine witnesses and or parties. Now, while this may appear essential to the judge to ensure equality of arms and a fair trial, a judge should be extremely cautious not to, as we would say in the UK, uh, enter into the arena and become too closely associated with, um, uh, involved in or identified with one or other side of the argument. If there is a risk of that happening, the case may well have to be adjourned to ensure the representation of the prosecution and or the civil party and to ensure the ability of the judge to preserve his or her uh, objective uh, impartiality. Um, finally, perhaps in this summary, beyond the functional aspect of the objective test, that test can also be satisfied where there are legitimate, where legitimate doubts arise 
from the applicant's personal conduct, um, sorry, where, from the judge's personal conduct, whether through statements made in the course of a hearing or in public, be it through the press or through social media, or whether the judge has personal links, direct or indirect, to one of the parties. That was just a quick uh, rundown of the key criteria in a sense to set the scene for our debate later and our exchanges later. And I very much look forward to our exchanges both in the room and more importantly with all of you in the hubs and, and the members of the, of the um, national judiciary and all the um, participating hubs. So I look very much look forward to um, these exchanges and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tim, for summarizing uh, in such a short time <laughs> this topic, uh, which is also of great importance and interest for the uh, for the participants, as you say, mostly in the in the hubs. Uh, and we hope to have to have questions and discussions on this issue. And now I see uh, on the screen our friend uh, from Strasbourg, Judge Ivana Jelic. Ivana, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I hear you. Perfect. <coughs> so the floor is yours, Ivana, to uh, elaborate briefly the other uh, topic on this, on this uh, panel, so the independence of the judiciary, please. Thank you, Larry. It would be a great challenge to actually address it briefly, but I will give my best. Uh, just as a remark, as agreed with the organizers, and for the sake of better understanding and um, equal approach towards all hubs, which now need the uh, interpretation, I would uh, like to address uh, in English, uh, having in mind that I connect online. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to tell you that it's my genuine pleasure and honor to take part and address this eminent uh, group of participants of the 8th Annual Rule of Law Forum for the Southeast Europe, uh, which is this year situated in Dubrovnik and seven city hubs, as well as Strasbourg, for three of us at least, who couldn't uh, come uh, uh, to Dubrovnik. Mm, I'm glad that uh, the forum has uh, come back to the region this year with its main uh, conference venue as well. Uh, I would like, I use the opportunity to thank for the organizers for their kind invitation and uh, impeccable, organiza impeccable organization as always. Uh, and in particular to Biljana Breitwaite and uh, Goran Milepic and their teams as well as to congratulate to, to Lady and Hannah for, for excellent handbook. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed uh, with uh, this work. So I'm happy to, to take part online, which actually has become a, a new normal way of, uh, of work. And finally, uh, as coming from the region, myself, I would like to thank coordinate to my fellow judges from the court for their readiness to dedicate their time to the forum again, uh, despite their tight agendas. And in particular, <clears throat> I would like to emphasize genuine support of our president, Robert Spano, and to cordially thank uh, to him for contributing to the rule of law to, to continue. Um, so without further ado, I would like to, to address the topic. I'm going to talk today about uh, as announced, uh, the key criteria to determine the, if the tribunal is independent. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to emphasize that the independence of judiciary is one of the key requirements for a society based on the rule of law. The Consultative Council of the European Judges in their 2010 Magna Carta of Judges fundamental principles stated that the judiciary is one of the three powers of any democratic state. <clears throat> its mission is to guarantee the very existence of the rule of law and thus to ensure the proper application of the law in an impartial, just, fair and efficient manner. 
Judicial independence and impartiality are essential prerequisites for the operation of justice. End of quotation. Further, the Venice Commission of the Rule of Law checklist uh, uh, adopted in its uh, 106th plenary session in 2016 also includes the independence of judiciary as a requirement for the rule of law. As such, this requirement is not only in Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, but also in many international instruments, including Article 14 of International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Uh, I plan to discuss uh, this topic also in a comparative uh, manner with the Human Rights Committee and the court, Luxembourg Court, but now I'm going to leave that maybe for the discussion and I'm going to concentrate mainly on the ECHR requirements and uh, <clears throat> also the criteria uh, by which a tribunal can be considered independent and in particular the manner of appointment of the members of the tribunal, duration uh, of uh, the judge's term of office, also uh, the existence of sufficient safeguards uh, against the risk of outside pressures uh, and also um, the appearance of independence. <clears throat> the first sentence of Article 6, paragraph 1 of our Convention states that in the termination of its civil rights and obligations or, or of any criminal charge against him, everyone is entitled to a fair and a public hearing within a reasonable time by an independent and impartial tribunal established by law. If we unpack this sentence, we find that the right requires, firstly, a tribunal, secondly, that this tribunal is established by law, thirdly, that the tribunal is impartial, and lastly, the tribunal must be independent. There is a a specific sui generis interlinked nature uh, of the criteria. The court has on numerous occasions stressed the independence, inter interdependence of all of these criteria. The requirement of independence therefore necessarily involves the question of impartiality and uh, whether the deciding body can be said to be a tribunal established by law in the sense of Article 6. This is due to the holistic manner in which the court examines the overall fairness of the trial. As a result, the notion of the independence of judiciary is <clears throat> inextricably linked with the notion of a tribunal itself. In the famous case uh, of Astrazon versus Iceland, the court stated that a judicial body which does not satisfy the requirements of independence, in particular from the executive, and of impartiality, cannot be characterized as a tribunal for the purpose of Article 6, Paragraph 1. Indeed, the court often examines the question of the independence and impartiality of the tribunal jointly when the circumstances of the case call for it. Uh, as it was the case in uh, Ramos Nunes de Carvalho and Sa versus Portugal, and also Finlay versus United Kingdom. From the case law, it is possible to glean broad criteria by which the court considers a uh, given tribunal to be independent. <clears throat> in the case of Finlay versus United Kingdom from 1997, the court explained that it examines the independence of a given tribunal on the basis of statutory criteria, such as the manner of appointment of the members of a tribunal, the duration of their term of office, the existence of sufficient safeguards against the risk of outside pressures, and whether the body presents uh, an appearance of independence. While it is tempting to segregate these criteria into need to separate boxes, uh, it's important to bear in mind the interconnected nature, as I said, in light of the object and purpose of Article 6, paragraph 1, to enshrine the right to a fair trial, a fair hearing. <clears throat> um, regarding the manner of appointment of the members of the tribunal, the court has found that appointment of judges by the executive does not in and of itself violate the independence requirement uh, of Article 6, Paragraph 1. What is crucial 
uh, here, and we have the examples in uh, Flux versus Moldova and Salisol Lorminess versus France, um, is uh, the fact that uh, once the judge is appointed, the judge is not subject to any pressure when carrying out their uh, judiciary role. Uh, the court conducts uh, always in concreto analysis. And I don't have time to go more into details here, but I would like to just say that <clears throat> in recent case of uh, Ashton versus Iceland, the court uh, 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 actually uh, emphasized diversity, <clears throat> which was mentioned by Robert and by Xenia as well, diversity of the legal traditions of the state parties I would, I would like to emphasize here. So the court cited the Venice Commission and the CCGA uh, who noted that there are a variety of different systems of Europe for the selection and appointment of judges rather than a single model uh, that would apply to all countries. And therefore, uh, quotation, although the notion of the separation of powers between the political organs uh, of government and judiciary has assumed growing importance in its case law, appointment of judges by the executive or the legislature is, prima, uh, is permissible under the convention provided that appointees are free from influence or pressure when carrying out their judiciary role. So the value of the court's approach, therefore, uh, is uh, that uh, it results in a scrutiny of the independence of the judiciary, in fact, and ensures equal protection of the right to an independent tribunal, regardless of the constitutional tradition of a framework of the particular state party, leading to a more uniform application of the convention and standardized definition of independence. Um, regarding the criteria on length uh, of a judge's term of office, the court has uh, refrained from specifically a particular term. This has been left within the state's marginal appreciation. However, the court has noted that it is generally considered that judges must be irremovable during their term of office. Uh, the court uh, found that the independence requirement of Article 6 is not breached when the removability of judges is not recognized in law, but it's recognized in fact along with the presence of other guarantees. So we have uh, uh, several uh, cases uh, relevant here. I would like to add also the case Luca versus Romania. Uh, <clears throat> and. Um, the court position on the removability of judges regarding their overall independence can be described as necessary but not sufficient. Um, in uh, um, recent uh, case law, in recent case Astrodom versus Iceland, the court, however, nuanced its position regarding the necessity of the removability of judges to the overall independence requirement. Um, and uh, I would like to say that in this case, it appears that the court envisages that the mechanism by which judges may be removed must pursue a legitimate objective <clears throat> and be proportional to the achie uh, achievement of uh, that objective. Uh, further, it uh, stressed both the importance of the appearance of uh, independence regarding risks uh, of outside influences as well as of impartiality. Uh, if there are not, if these are not met, then the removal mechanism would violate Article 6.1 independence requirement. However, this does not represent a departure from its previous case law. Rather, it represents a flexibility uh, in the court's approach. The court does not lose sight of the importance of the other criteria by which the importance, independence of a given tribunal may be assessed, nor of the other requirements under Article 6, such as impartiality. Again, this affirms that the court's holistic approach to the question of independence and its ability to embrace a multi multitude uh, of judicial systems. Regarding uh, existence of su sufficient safeguards against the risk of outside pressure, I would like also to quote um, again Ashton uh, versus Iceland. Uh, 
uh, in this case, the existence of sufficient safeguards uh, against risk of outside pressures uh, is a key aspect of independence uh, requirement under Article 6. In order for judges to be independent, they must also be free from undue influence uh, that is both external and internal, external uh, meaning outside of the judiciary, and internal uh, uh, within the judiciary, uh, for example, by from the fellow judges. <clears throat> Here, I would like to call your attention also to two cases, Moisey versus Russia and uh, Agro Complex versus Ukraine. Um, we don't have so much time right now to 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 address them in details, but I would like just to to uh, note uh, that. Uh, uh, actually, um, uh, it is enough that there is a risk of vulnerability to outside pressure. Uh, the requirement of Article 6 is quite uh, stringent uh, here, uh, and uh, especially in agro complex versus Ukraine, and it ties into the fourth criterion <clears throat> of the appearance of independence, which is the last one that I'm going to. Um, to, to address the, and I hope that... Isana, briefly, please. Sorry? Yes, yes, sure. Could, could you, could you uh, sum up I, and conclude, please? According to my, to my, uh, to my watch, uh, I'm using my 10th minute, uh, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, just to, to just uh, 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 emphasize that the court has explained the basis of uh, this rule. The public, <clears throat> importantly in criminal cases, uh, the, the, the accused uh, must have confidence in the court in a democratic society. Uh, subjective perception uh, in the mind of accused that the tribunal is not independent, while relevant, is not sufficient to conclude an absence of independence. Uh, <clears throat> overall, uh, the court's approach to the requirement of independence can be described as adaptable yet consistent adaptable because it takes into account the variation of in legal traditions among the 47 different states uh, uh, it is consistent also uh, in that uh, it always has uh, regard to the overall independence of the judiciary whilst it exam examines each of the criteria uh, that i mentioned uh, thank you for your attention um, and for for extent of time. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ivana, and I'm sorry to <laughs> make you really conclude in a uh, kind of two minutes. Uh, the topic, as we all know, is, is huge, uh, but the idea is to leave some time for, for the discussion, for questions, and we have already one registered uh, introduction uh, in this panel. Uh, yes, but before before that, I would just like to mention that uh, because it was mentioned by the President's panel this morning, and especially by reference to our friends from, from Albania and from Kosovo, his article on the rule of law as a lodestar star of the European Convention of Human Rights has been translated in Albania and published in Albania, so can be accessible for all the participants, and I hope this will be the case in other countries of the region uh, as well. So then I'll leave you the, the floor. Thanks, Lady. Thanks for reminding me. I wanted to make this point. So we've also published a bar article in the Air Center's Human Rights Bulletin. So it's in, available in BCMS as well. And we will make sure it's translated into Macedonian. Um, so, so that it is. And we can then, perhaps with President's agreement, make it available on Rule of Law Platform website as well so that it can be sort of accessed widely. We are now moving um, to the second part um, of our panel and as sort of ladies said and, and I mean it's clear from speakers presentations um, there was so much more to say uh, but we really want to give uh, participants from the region opportunity to speak. I would now ask please Milos to put um, everyone on the screen. Um, of course Judge Behabovic and all um, seven hubs. Um, we have, given that we are uh, running over time and we'd like to hear from each hub, um, I propose that we um, have lunch 15 minutes later. So we have lunch at 12.45, which means that we start at 1.45 instead of 
Um, but nevertheless, 45 minutes is not a huge amount when we are hearing from both Judge Behabovic very briefly and Seven Hubs. So I'd please ask you kindly to be brief, um, to ask one or two questions and to, to stay with the questions rather than giving wider comments. There will be opportunity to have national discussions after the second panel. Um, what I propose to do is hand over to Judge Behabovic and then um, take questions from three or four hubs. Uh, what would be fantastic is if you could introduce yourself, um, give us a clear question and say if you're addressing it to a particular judge or to the full panel and then the panel can, can decide how to handle it. We will then, after hearing from four hubs, go back to the panel respond to questions, and then go to the remaining three hubs. So, Judge Bekhabovic, please, look forward to hearing your introduction. Thank you all. Thank, I would like to thank the AI our center. Uh, so, I hope that this forum will make it possible for all our colleagues to learn more about the most recent case law of the European Court of Human Rights. What I wanted to uh, say, and I don't want to repeat what the previous speakers have already said, is the following. I don't have any other option. I simply must mention some of the uh, elements already mentioned by previous speakers and I must underline the importance of our discussions on these issues. Naturally, the first question that comes to mind is why are all these elements so important and how can we be sure that we are properly applying all these aspects in our everyday work? To be a judge today means that we apply the most relevant case law, be it on the national or international level, which that again means that we apply the practice of the highest instance courts in our countries, but at the same time we are applying the practice of the European Court of Human Rights, which is the reference point for application of our principles. The case law of the European Court is the point at which we can find the right answers to our questions about tribunals, about their, uh, about judges' impartiality and um, independence, uh, and regarding a requirement uh, arising from Article 6 uh, regarding uh, a tribunal being established by law. As it has been quite eloquently put by my colleagues, the basic purpose of application is to simply exhaust all possibilities to be able to ensure a fair trial within the broadest possible meaning of this word and sense of this word to the entire community, which needs uh, to have a visible benefit uh, uh, from that. Also, we strive to um, ensure uh, that the public trusts in the functioning of the system. I believe it's a great role and responsibility that rests upon our shoulders. Only then we as judges uh, will be able to ensure justice in the community uh, and we can stop all those negative effects which are visible due to different social and political circumstances in the Western Balkan countries. Only then we will be able to uh, put an end to migrations and all those negative things that we can all see are making our countries losing their population simply because we do not have a proper system in place to ensure justice to people. People will say that economy is the most important element that uh, keeps people together. However, I'd say that the issue of judicial system, that the matter of judicial system and fairness of procedures and uh, equality of everyone before law is actually that glue that s keeps together 
uh, that, pe that keeps people together uh, once they realize, of course, that the system is actually functioning and there are no uh, such thing as um, uh, untouchable persons. And when they see that there are uh, criteria applied equally in all different procedures, we in the Balkans have learned these lessons in the hard way. And by extension, we judges in the Balkan have a more difficult task to accomplish. And that's to um, meet the expectations of our citizens, to give this little piece of justice, to make sure that it happens uh, in a way that uh, Article 6 requirements are of course met. But at the same time, our judgments, we have to make sure that they are motivated by proper legal arguments. By doing that, we uh, are making and we would be making a huge step forward. I'm not sure if it would be purposeful for me to repeat some of the things already mentioned by previous speakers. Perhaps it would be better for me to stop here. Clearly, Birena and Lady are a bit anxious or uh, nervous about the timing, about the um, agenda that we're not properly sticking to. Once again, I'd like to wish us all a um, successful event. I will also underline that, uh, indeed, the matter of uh, fairness of trials and the uh, matter of uh, um, us applying uh, uh, case law at both national and, and, and international level is the example, is uh, the um, showcase that people are looking at and, and, and taking into consideration when they're deciding whether to stay or to leave. And, and that's the key issue for us in the Balkans. Thank you. Thank you, Faris. You have excellently summed up what the colleagues had been talking about. The problem, our problem is that we have a panel that, uh, well, it itself, uh, uh, well, could last for two days, and we're trying to uh, um, make it happen in uh, an hour in a, in a half. As I said, we will give the floor to uh, City Hubs, Belgrade. First of all, we would like to uh, thank the judges for their excellent presentations. Now I will pass the floor to Ms. Bilena Sinanovic. She is a deputy president of the Supreme Court of Cessation, and she has a question for the panel. Good day, everyone. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk to you, even in an online format. Uh, greetings to all my colleagues, especially colleagues at the European Court of Human Rights. Since we do not have a lot of time, I, I will ask a, a general question, rather a general question, because Serbia is right now the, introducing constitutional amendments uh, regarding uh, the, its judiciary. Uh, the uh, basis for both impartiality and independence is knowledge. I liked it very much when Ms. Turkovic said that the one of the basic things is knowledge, ability to communicate and ability to make decisions. My question for you is, what do you think? Who is uh, the person or who is the body that needs to decide to assess that? Is it the body that appoints judges, that elects judges in our country? It's the High Judicial Council, or that should be should that be a, some uh, sort of an education institution, to put it that way, that, as far as I know, exists uh, exists in. Uh, um, exists in some European countries as a as an institution that a young uh, lawyers law graduates uh, are um, required to um, uh, to go to to attend uh, before they are appointed judges so the requirement to attend 
attend courses of such uh, um, institution, for instance, of traditional academy, would be a possibility to um, um, maybe then be discriminatory uh, um, uh, against people who are um, uh, who haven't completed that kind of academy or in, uh, program and want to become judges. Milena, can we go ahead or we will pass the floor to yes. another? Yes, yes, please yes. go ahead. Please go ahead okay. with another quick one. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Then we have a, a question from my colleague, uh, Violeta Vashirevich. Uh, thank you very much. Being a constitutional lawyer, I would like to ask all three judges uh, to comment uh, the further uh, facts. I think that the judgment in Ratkovic versus Poland is particularly important uh, for confronting uh, the democratic backsliding in Poland. But what worries is the enforcement of this judgment particularly having in mind that the ruling government have been not only avoiding to implement uh, the judgments of the European Court of Justice in court packing cases, but also they even adopted legislation forbidding their judges uh, to address uh, this court and to implement the EU law. So I'm wondering how to secure the enforcement of this judgment and whether something similar could be expected with regard to Ratskovic uh, judgment. Thank you very much. Many thanks. So thanks this to is Belgrade. All for now. Yes, and thank, thank you, you so Ivana. Thank you. Um, we will now move to Podgorica immediately. Thank you, Biljana. So on behalf of the Podgorica Hub, I would like to say that we have a question on behalf of the NGO sector. There's a representative of the Civic Alliance NGO which uh, would like to ask a question to judges of the European Court of Human Rights, if I may. So, uh, Zoran Vujicic, on behalf of the Civic Alliance NGO, I would like to to tackle the aspect of uh, independence of judge and to hear the comments of the uh, judges of the European Cor Court of Human Rights, to so hear their comments on the fact that uh, in uh, Montenegro some of the uh, housing issues have been solved for certain judges and prosecutors and they have been awarded uh, houses not by the Judicial Council but by the state authorities and uh, not by the uh, well-established criteria and the points that are awarded for, uh, settle, uh, for resolving the housing issues of judges and prosecutors. Um, of judges to, to assess whether they can address all the questions. We will now move to Pristina. Pristina, can you hear us? Are they froze? Yes. Perhaps we, in that case, go to Sarajevo um, and we will come back to Pristina. I can't even see Sarah. Why don't we go to Skopje? I can see Skopje there and present. So why don't we go to Skopje and take their questions, please? Yeah, hello again. Uh, we will have two questions. The first one comes from the director of the Judicial Academy, um, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Ga Ms. Gaber. Uh, she would like to know, uh, she would have a question uh, concerning uh, the uh, concept of the tri tribunal established by law. Uh, she would like to know uh, whether, in case, um, uh, if a body, uh, which is, um, first of all, uh, of course, Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the Convention defines tribunal in a broader uh, terms, uh, so that it covers, covers not only courts, but also other bodies, uh, which are established in accordance with the national law. Uh, so she would like to know uh, in particular whether in case such body was established in accordance with the national law, in addition to other safeguards, guarantees, standards, uh, 
under Article 6, uh, which are applicable to the proceedings before such a body. There is also a requirement under the Convention and um, in accordance uh, with the ECHR case law uh, that the state should ensure the right to appeal against the decisions which are taken by that body. Uh, I hope that, that you understand this question. Uh, and now also the co-moderator, uh, Professor Preshoa, would, would have another uh, more academic <laughs> question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the judges, panelists today for their very interesting and insightful uh, interventions and presentations. Uh, I would have a more general question concerning what uh, Judge Yelich mentioned uh, in regards to uh, the diverging or uh, different stages of uh, traditions on judicial independence in different countries, especially the division between more developed and established democracies of Western and uh, Southern Europe and uh, the so-called, I will use an unpopular term, post-socialist countries of Central and Eastern and Southeastern Europe. And whether these diverging legal traditions uh, and the lack of long-standing legal tradition in some of the countries has created obstacles and difficulties in devising the standards, criteria, and tests uh, in the so far case law of, of the European Court. And another related uh, question. Um, could you uh, single out a, some type of pattern among Central and Eastern European and Southeastern European countries? Because most of the case law is regarding these uh, uh, countries from this region uh, involving Poland, Hungary, Ukraine, also North Macedonia now. Uh, would you single out a, some type of pattern which could be related to their uh, socialist, previous socialist tradition? Uh, and their approach to the role of judiciary and rule of law within their respective legal and political systems. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, Sir Belimir, I need to go back to you because I, I don't think I got a question and I don't think panelists got a question. Can you put it in one sentence? The, the initial question, the first question. Oh, mean. of course. Article 6 current is not uh, um, uh, and defines tribunal not only as a court but also as a body which is, uh, has the competence to resolve uh, uh, disputes in a broader uh, terms. Uh, the question is uh, wh whether in a case that uh, such body is established by law, so it's not a court, it's some other uh, body, for instance, Judicial Council or whatever, whatever uh, there would be also a right to appeal against the decisions uh, against uh, that body, uh, which, is, uh, which would be a standard of the Convention, not only a standard of the national law, whether there is such requirement under the Convention. That is the question, the right to appeal. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Sorry. Uh, we have questions from three hubs now. I suggest that we go to back to panel, address those. Again, keep the, the answers brief. Uh, maybe sort of in turn, sort of, Tim, if there are questions you'd like to address, maybe you could sort of start off and we could work our way this way. Also, there were some questions that might be interesting to comment upon from the respective Venice Commission. And Thomas, you might want to do this now or, or sort of later. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Brianna, and thank you for those questions. Um, uh, personally, I think the, the last question that was raised about about the, the, the right of appeal is probably um, one that's that's not unimportant because it has arisen in, in in certain circumstances, not necessarily where we have addressed whether um, the first instance body um, determining a dispute in relation to civil rights and obligations usually was a tribunal, but where we considered where there were deficiencies, such as independence, and the cases I'm thinking of are UK housing cases, for example, social housing cases, where it is a government inspector who makes fact findings and makes the decisions. And we have decided that in those cases where there was a deficiency, that deficiency could be remedied by an appeal to a court of law. Um, but beyond that, where the tribunal is a tribunal established by law and um, uh, and satisfies all the tests and all the requirements of Article 6, um, uh, subject to what my colleagues have to say, there is no, um, no uh, inevitable right to uh, appeal uh, under the Convention. Um, can I um, 
perhaps also just deal with, with one other aspect briefly. The first question came coming from the Belgrade hub about, um, as, under, as understood it, who decides that the competence of judges sitting and whether it should be um, an educational body or a judicial council. Uh, that, I think, raises very important questions. Of course, there needs to be an assessment of, of educational competence before you enter, in a sense, enter into any profession, including that of judges. Um, but, um, and as far as I'm, I'm aware, we're still um, to have to address that directly. Um, but there is, is an issue if, um, there seems to me there is a risk of an issue, in particular in relation to appearances of impartiality and protect, but potentially independence, if those decisions of appointment to a particular tribunal or level of jurisdiction were left solely to an educational establishment. Um, I think those are the two I want to pick out. I'll happily comment on, on others. Sorry, I, I'm taking the mic. Uh, I, I would agree with what uh, uh, on the last point that that uh, team has uh, emphasized, and uh, it is what is really important. It is for for each state actually to devise the system, but uh, and, and and really to to assess all the qualities that we are requiring from judges. And sometimes when you look at these requirements, it almost seems that we are requiring a perfect creature that actually do not exist <laughs> if we put all of that together it's uh, uh, but we all have to aspire to, to, to live to these utmost standards so it's really uh, but what, what, what is important it's very difficult to assess that but what is important that the process is transparent this is really uh, uh, crucial uh, and that uh, there is a possibility uh, to follow you know, how the election has been done, how the appointment has been done, that there is the possibility of appeal, that there could be a, a decision on that. So this is very important to secure. Uh, education and specific education, uh, many, many states are going in that direction. It would be beneficial, but I agree uh, completely that it should not be solely uh, upon the educational institution to, 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 to judge the competencies of uh, future uh, judges. The second question was, and I'm just, uh, was uh, Let's, um, Let's give versus Poland and democratic backslide, and, uh, and it was related to the uh, European Court of Justice and the, the actually refusal of the, uh, if I understood correctly, uh, the, 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 the refusal of the um, national Courts. So there was this especially constitutional court of uh, of, of Poland to, to to follow European court uh, judgments, and um, you know, and what what is the role of the Polish Supreme Court and the constitutional court uh, as an EU court, especially Supreme Court as an EU court implementing the uh, European. Uh, Court of Justice uh, judgments, and as uh, we all uh, well know, there is the obligation of the national courts actually to directly apply the decisions of the European Court of Justice, and if uh, the court, uh, there is that uh, direct obligation and there is a judgment by the uh, European uh, Court of Justice which is emphasizing this obligation of the national courts. Um, and if the courts are not doing that, then they are not meeting the requirements of the independence and impartiality. But this is also raising a very interesting question, actually, about, and, and this is more for us to give an answer, uh, of the relationship between uh, our judgments and the application of our judgments at the national level where uh, in, um, I would say, majority of the states there is a rule that uh, the, these judgments could be, uh, should be applied directly. And this is actually um, uh, sometimes making an awkward situation. Why? Because uh, the judgments of the constitutional court, you know, when there is the issue of the constitutionality, 
of certain provision, then national courts could not apply directly constitution. But if there is an issue of the uh, breach of the case law of the, of the convention and the case law of the court, then the national courts could apply directly. And there is some kind of um, uh, imbalance in this respect. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that this is something that the court and the national courts will really in the future have to look very carefully into and how to resolve that imbalance that, 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 that you know, uh, raises tensions in the national level sometimes. And this is connected also uh, to the uh, judgments of the European Court of Justice, but they are in a different, you know, in the different landscape. This is a different thing with a supranational organization. So this is the second question. Uh, the, the, the third question I will leave to, to Ivana. This is something that is particular for, the, for, for Montenegro, I, I believe. Uh, the legal traditions and uh, whether we can see uh, and whether the differences in legal traditions are creating difficulties for the court. Of course, they are creating difficulties for the court, but the court is there, there to, 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 to resolve that. And, and what we are doing, we are actually coming up with the common standards and we are always coming with the common denominator. Uh, do you see that there are particular problems in the transitional states or former, uh, whether we can, you know, many of the former socialist countries we cannot call anymore transitional states, some of them we still can. Uh, so whether we see that there is a certain approach to the judiciary and the independence and impartiality that uh, maybe creates problems in this area. Yeah, I would say yes. And I will give you just uh, one thing that I always remember from one lecture of one professor in, in, in Croatia when I, when I was a student, and he was a professor of civil law, and he was trying to explain it. And that was the time when Croatia was still a socialist country. Yes, and then he was trying to explain to us why, why lawyers and judges are not respected in socialist countries, because they really were not. You know, they really were not. And then why? Because, you know, they were always somehow counter to the establishment, counter to the establishment. And somehow we inherited this view of, of judiciary, you know, not always positive view of judiciary. And uh, uh, you could see, for example, what is striking me, for example, Croatia in the rule of law, uh, what is that rule of law? Um, Mm, investing in another report, yes, rule of law report is one of the states that has the lowest respect for the judiciary, you know, and it is not really reflecting the real situation in the judiciary, I would say, uh, but it is to a certain uh, extent also a result of our inheritance that was not properly resolved through the time. So there are things to be dealt with, you know, and, and, and how we perceive judiciary in former socialist countries. So I'm stopping here. I think, I think we... Lord Trivana, um, if we can see her. Um, Thomas Margaret also wanted to comment briefly. Yes, uh, so, sorry? Yes, of course, of course, if there are sort of issues, I mean, maybe begin even uh, uh, even at the floor um, and then yeah. result, but I think at, sort of from this point onwards, if we can really, I have to ask judges as well, uh, keep the responses brief, because we have another uh, few hubs to go back to, and even with our change schedule, we have 19 minutes left. Thank yeah. you. Uh, may I proceed now? Thank you. Okay, just uh, only two questions are left to me. Thank, uh, to, thanks to Xenia and uh, team. Uh, the academic question, do you hear me well? Just to, to make sure you hear me well? Yes, yes we do. The academic question from colleague uh, Pleshova from North Macedonia uh, about uh, <coughs> diversity about diversity, I want to just to emphasize that we in the court are aware of diversity of legal traditions of the state parties. Uh, and of course, we from the Western Balkans, we have the special burden of uh, uh, realizing the rule of law uh, because uh, the rule of, the, the, this is the region uh, in which uh, for centuries, uh, law 
uh, hasn't ruled but the powers. So a new era of uh, uh, law to rule and the development of the culture of human rights and I would say the culture of the rule of law and the uh, respect of diversity is something that we are all building in the region. And in that sense, I think we should also understand the, this uh, criteria concerning appointment of members of the tribunal established by law, which actually means that the appointees have to feel and in reality be free from any influence or pressure. Uh, outside or inside pressure. Concerning Montenegrin, the question from Montenegrin Hub, I would like to address in my language. I would like uh, I would really not like to tell you that this issue of uh, resolving housing issues by the um, uh, enforce, uh, executive branch to those holding judicial office can be problematic in this uh, sense in terms of in sense of uh, independence but it doesn't necessarily have to be it really depends uh, on concrete circumstances and of course each case needs to be uh, analyzed individually and based on the uh, responses that we get to once we analyze all of the circumstances of a particular ca case can we adopt a particular stance a particular standpoint so m maybe this can be um, you know it, it, this might come up as an issue in the cases that will might be lodged before this court in this case of course I cannot make a comment now because in that case I would have to exclude myself from uh, the trial and this would be a result uh, you know responsible towards the court and towards the uh, function that I'm covering B is to do the round of the remaining hubs and then you can give a final comment <coughs> because there might be another questions arising um, I apologize to the remaining hubs uh, you will get turn first turn on the next panel uh, but I have to ask you now um, to just pose one question and pose it briefly so first going to Sarebo Okay, thank you, Bilena. Uh, from the Sarajevo Hub, um, there is one participant, Emira Hodzic, uh, from the Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, who would like to um, ask a question. Thank you so much. Good day, Emira Hodzic, from the Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I have a question for the esteemed uh, judges having to do with impartiality uh, contained in Article 6. This Article 6 is incorporated through the procedural in the procedural law, and I will mm, focus on criminal aspect uh, in the law and criminal uh, procedure and the Institute for uh, the um, exemption um, uh, uh, of judges and the law actually lists in which cases the judge cannot be part of a procedure uh, for example if he has been a witness to a case or if he has been the injured party or um, and so on and so forth but however there is this aspect also which says that if there are circumstances which uh, cause reasonable doubt into his or her impartiality and this is where we go back to the objective and subjective uh, ap or, uh, approach. Okay, subjective one is uh, clear. So, for example, a judge judges uh, personal activities or, or uh, standpoints can cause a suspicion into th or doubt into their uh, impartiality, but it's uh, the objective ones that are questionable. We have seen through different uh, guides that there are some uh, fa facts that can be uh, used to determine one's impartiality. Uh, here we often have a case where, for example, judges have been acting in the control of detention of a of a uh, and then later on a judge who is educating this case shows up or for example if several persons uh, were involved in a particular criminal offense and now uh, the trial is going to be set set up for uh, some of those uh, some some of those defendants and at a later stage it's also going to be a, a, a trial organized for the rest of the uh, defendants so for example if a judge took part in both of them maybe his um, uh, his uh, inclusion his participation in the former case maybe already affects how he will uh, uh, act at a later stage in a different hearing so can you tell us if there are maybe some criteria that can be used here or m whether there's maybe some latest case law uh, of the European Court of Human Rights that could help us you know shed light on this
sorry, we can't hear you yet. Why don't we go to Zagreb? Uh, can you, can you hear, hear us? Krishna, we can hear you now, yes. Please go ahead. So we have one question uh, from uh, Jazz Nesmira Djepi from the Constitutional Court of Kosovo. Thank you. Well, uh, happy we are back to the conversation as my uh, question regards uh, the matter of conversation. Um, I um, uh, go back to what uh, Judge and President Spano in his uh, opening remarks underlined uh, as one of the key elements to ensure the public confidence for the judiciary is that uh, judges uh, get involved in uh, conversation. I assume he referred also to public conversation that is appropriate to the judicial function. And uh, given the fact that uh, we live in the environments that sometimes get quite highly sensitive, and the prejudices about the judiciary by far transcend the reality. Um, my question would be, and uh, would be answered to any of the panelists, uh, how courts or judges shall approach this matter, particularly as regard to the general public? Thanks. I'm now going to Tirana. One question, please. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we have uh, two questions. One question from the judge uh, uh, Parim Kalo from Constitutional Court. And also another question will be from the Ombudsman of Albania, uh, Ms. Arinda Balanza, that are present in the panel. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we appreciate the being invited here and uh, sharing uh, views and concepts. And uh, we learn very much because our court is new, as you uh, know, the court relatively new in terms of uh, function. Uh, now, the question of, uh, of uh, uh, establishment by law uh, creates, uh, 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 certainly creates a big, uh, uh, big problems in Albania. If it was to, to be considered uh, ignoring the opinion of, of the uh, Venice Commission, uh, which somehow has accepted that uh, the, the uh, missing uh, procedure for appointment of judges due to uh, specificity of the country, due to the given conditions, uh, would uh, uh, create problems in the judgment that have been already uh, made in, in, in this uh, period of time. So the establishment of the court, there's no, no. The, the establishment of the court took place finally in December uh, uh, last year, 24th of December. And uh, uh, for some reason, I was the person to, to, uh, to uh, constitute again the, the court in the, the, in the sense of uh, meeting one of the criteria or one of the obligations uh, uh, set by international uh, community, uh, uh, basically the EU, uh, as, a, as a condition for uh, accession in the, uh, in the process uh, of uh, EU integration. So. Uh, given this, I think that uh, uh, the result of the, of, the, of the vetting created an unprecedented situation, which I don't think that it has happened in other countries. So either we had to uh, wait until the, the nominating authorities be fully functional, like, for example, Supreme Court, which is still not able to appoint uh, judges in the constitutional court, and we're missing still. Uh, we're missing judges in the uh, from from what the constitution has established. Uh, so, or to to proceed uh, uh, by uh, in full agreement with international, uh, let's say, uh, uh, factor, and that's why I mentioned also Venice Commission because the issue was raised in the Venice Commission, which somehow blessed this process 
which means that uh, uh, lacking the con uh, sequence of appointment by three authorities. Because uh, for, for those who don't know, we have J Judge Bianco that knows very well the Albanian uh, maybe circumstances, but uh, uh, there are three nominating authorities. is the institution of the President of the Republic, is the, the, the Parliament, and the uh, Supreme Court. So, and they have to, to, to feed the court uh, when the vacancies are created. But the vacancies in, in the case of Albania were not vacancies that are uh, normally uh, established in the, in the Constitution. Because it's a normal vacancy is created by, uh, by one judge for certain reasons uh, that are established in the law. So the question is that how, how we deal with this uh, situation in, 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 the, in the future if the first cases may be raised by, by, by parties, uh, considering that uh, the, the court is not established by law. Thank you. If I, if I could kindly ask Ms. Balanza, the Albanian Ombudsman, to put her question this, this afternoon. Okay. Ainda, I'm sorry. No problem, it's okay. Thank you. And, and we are... The one remaining half, we are going to Zagreb for a brief question, um, and then we will address um, all of the questions. Uh, thank you, Biljana. Uh, we have one question which is actually related to current issue uh, in Croatia and uh, it's in um, uh, can and does the way the President of the Supreme Court is elected affect the impartiality of that court? Uh, namely, in Croatia, uh, the President of the Supreme Court is elected by the Parliament on proposal of the President of the State and the opinions of the judges of the Supreme Court are not decisive in the, that proceedings. Thank you. So, um, shall we do it again, Tim? Shall we start with you and the reducer impartiality point in particular? Um, thank you very much. I think there were two, um, sorry, two impartiality questions. The first from the Sarajevo Hub um, about um, the objective test and where a judge has previously sat in um, cases involving the detention of a defendant or cases involving co-defendants. They don't, uh, under our case, well, certainly they don't by necessity lead to a problem of impartiality, but it will require a case-by-case -case, uh, analysis in, in relation to how, for example, the judge has expressed himself or herself in relation to those detention issues or in relation to the circumstances of a criminal offence where he or she has already adjudicated or been panel of a court which adjudicated on the case, the case of um, co-defendants. The, um, the, the, can I just, for, for time purposes, the um, relevant up-to-date case law is in your very um, helpful guide. Uh, page numbers in, in different languages will vary, but it's around um, footnotes 173 onwards under the heading separate but related proceedings where the case law is very helpfully um, summarized up to date and um, can I perhaps for economy suggest that you um, uh, refer to those and some of the summaries will also be in the um, in the background uh, in the in the in the rest of the paper in the annex um, can I perhaps also just briefly um, uh, reflect on the question that has come um, from Zagreb and no doubt um, Xenia will want to or may want to comment on this too um, and perhaps just to reflect that um, the, the situation where an, a, a, especially a president of the constitutional court is elected or appointed by a um, by um, uh, by parliament or, or is appointed formally appointed by the president on a proposal by parliament or by the political bodies is, is not uncommon within the uh, within the convention member states and therefore does not uh, by itself necessarily raise issues about um, impartiality again it would uh, I would anticipate um, require a case-by-case -case analysis in relation to the case in, in question and um, for reasons which um, I think Ivana mentioned earlier if that case were to come to us I'm not going to speculate um, what the results would be thank you Tim, many thanks. Xenia, if we can go to you briefly, perhaps to address in particular questions 
that the team didn't get a chance to address, then to Thomas, and then Lady will wrap up. Well, uh, the, the, the questions uh, asked by the Albanian judges, I would actually leave uh, Lady to answer, I think, because he would be the most competent one to do that. Uh, in terms of the first question, uh, the team provided uh, 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 an answer, and we can find everything in the guide, and I could just direct that uh, sometimes it's helpful, you know, when, when you are looking at the cases from the region, when, when you are having these issues. So if you look uh, there are a number of uh, Croatian cases that were dealing with that issue in the past few years, so I would uh, recommend to, 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 to read of them, and uh, we really differentiated uh, these issues when there is obligation, when there is the discretion, when there is all, all the questions that we, all you have asked, and there are answers in, in the case law. Uh, and then uh, the, the last issue, well, uh, we are in Croatia now, no? <laughs> and this is the issue that is tormenting in a a uh, Croatian judiciary for past uh, few months, uh, uh, and um, but uh, the, the direct answer for that we cannot find in our case law, and that might be a case, a future case in which we will have to find an answer to to to, do, to, to that issue. And in this way, uh, I cannot provide an, um, to this really uh, very specific and particular question. You know whether the um the, the 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 opinion of the Supreme Court should have more obligatory character for the president when the president is uh, making a proposal. Uh, for example, the Polish cases that we had in front of us, uh, that there the law is different. Uh, the, the Icelandic case, Astrakson, we have seen that the law is specific, domestic law on that issue, which says that uh, the, the minister in the case was not obliged by the opinion of the evaluation committee, but then the minister had to provide uh, good justification why, why the, 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 the opinion of the evaluation committee is not followed. So, so this is something that you know could be considered when these issues are discussed at the domestic level in Croatia. Many thanks. Mr. Marker, please. Thank you. Maybe I feel obliged to say something on the first question from other grade because this issue of the Judicial Academy came up very much in the previous round of discussions on the reform of the Serbian Constitution. And for the Venice Commission, it did really have to be a problem to request one criterion for becoming a judge to have successfully passed the Judicial Academy, as is also you have to have a law degree, etc. But it's clear after university you cannot immediately become a judge and the Venice Commission is against probationary periods for judges. So having a judicial academy seems in principle a good thing. Of course there have to be certain legislative guarantees for the independence of this judicial academy but in principle we were quite favorable to this approach. On question from Skopje, Judicial Council, we have never considered the Judicial Council acting in disciplinary matters to be an independent tribunal, but for us there has to be an appeal to the independent tribunal which comes after the disciplinary decisions of the disciplinary decision of the Judicial Council. On the question from Albania, uh, the rules on the appointment of constitutional court judges in Albania were of extraordinary complexity and we had a lot of problems understanding and interpreting them. I don't think it makes sense to enter into this here. I would only underline that we did not say the rules have not, do not have to be followed. The rules have to be followed, but we interpreted the rules in a certain manner. That was the approach and not we don't want to follow the rules. Very briefly, I, I concur with, with Thomas in saying that the Albanian Constitution, Article, Article 179b, it's quite complex, providing that the first uh, vacancy of the Albanian Constitution has to be filled in by the President of the Republic, the second one by the Parliament, and the third one by the Supreme Court. And the idea, reading the, the, the commentaries of the Constitutional Reform 2016, was to have a kind of judicial representation on the Constitutional Court. Now the problem was that the Albanian Supreme Court uh, was left 
with only one judge for three years, so was not able to appoint the new constitutional court. So the third judge, the sixth judge, and the ninth judge. And last year, Judge Kahlo is right that under the pressure of the international community, a uh, constitutional court was somehow established, and now there is a big issue whether this way of establishing, there is no judge appointed by the Supreme Court yet. There is an interpretation that the former judge elected under the former regime is considered as appointed by the Supreme Court, which I doubt this is kind of political kind of consideration. Uh, but the question is very tricky. However, I invite the, the Albanian Constitutional Court, when they are faced with this issue judicially, uh, under the big principle established uh, in Strasbourg, in Astrazon, but also in Luxembourg, in, uh, in previous cases since 2000, 2008, Chronopost, for example, that a tribunal established by law is an, is an uh, issue that the courts shall examine ex officio because it is a public order issue. So when they'll have the chance, they should, they should uh, deal with this issue and let's see what, what the real answer would be from the, from the Constitutional Court. But it's very, it's very tricky. Many thanks. Um, it remains to thank all the panelists thank my co-moderator, um, thank all the hubs.